Have you ever been building or working on a project before and thought, you know what would make this cooler? Adding pixels to it. Or maybe you've wanted to add buttons or switches or sensors or anything of the like to control your pixels and make it more interactive. Or maybe you wanted to run a little tiny light display on your desk or something like that on your Lego house, of course. Well, all these things are possible with the current light show technology we have, but it can be long and hard to set up with lots of different programming needed and separate controllers and expenses and all that. Well, not anymore thanks to this new product from Falcon Controllers, the F-Prop. This little tiny two inch squared board right here allows you to connect over 2000 pixels and run them based on things that are happening in the environment around it. It has six trigger pins, the ability to hook up ultrasonic sensors, vibration sensors, and tons of other things so you can make projects like the ones I talked about. And there are so many different other things you could do with this board, it is crazy. Like if you wanted to wear pixels and walk around with them on, you could have this little tiny board control them. If only I had a bunch of pixels I could put on and wear and walk around and use this to control them with. But this entire video is going to be all about the F-Prop, how you set it up, how you could program it, and tons of other situations you can use it for. So, let's start the video. Hey everyone, my name is Nick, and thanks for tuning into How To Pixel. If this is your first time watching, thanks for coming by. This channel is all about light shows. Christmas light shows, Halloween light shows, anything to do with lights and how to program them and use them. Mostly with pixel lights. Today, like I said in the intro, we are talking about a new product from Falcon Controllers, and that is the F-Prop. Now before we get started with the tutorial, like always, please feel free to use the timestamps in the scrub bar and in the description below, so you can skip to whatever part of the video you want to see and save time. This tutorial is going to be split up into a couple of different sections. First, I'm going to talk about the basics with the F-Prop, what it's used for, uh, what scenarios you can use it for, and just some basics on how it works. Then we'll take a closer look at the board and look at all the components, see how they work, and look at some specifications about it. We'll also see how you can make some sequences to put on the board to run some pixels, and then finally, we'll look at how you make the program file and upload it to the board so you can make it work. Now this video is going to be a bit of a longer video because there is a lot of information with the F-Prop and how to use it. So that's why it's split up into sections and that's why the timestamps are there so you can skip to whatever part you want to see. But with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into the basics with the F-Prop and see how it works. So the F-Prop was designed by David Pitts and Keith Wesley and it was released a little bit earlier this year, 2024. It's one of Falcon Controller's newest products, and its goal is to be a small standalone controller that can control up to a couple of thousand pixels based on what's happening in the environment around it. There are two pixel ports, each can run 1,024 pixels, and that makes a total of 2,048 pixels this board can run, with power injection, of course. There's also six different trigger pins across the board a built-in vibration sensor, and a spot to hook up an ultrasonic sensor so you can use all those things and attach buttons or switches or any other types of sensors to these triggers to make the sequences and pixels run. If you're familiar with an Arduino microcontroller, it's very similar to that, how you can hook up tons of sensors and buttons and lots of different things, but instead of controlling other things on the Arduino, the F-Prop will control pixels based on what those inputs are doing. There's even an audio jack to output audio with your sequences. There's 15 megabytes of onboard flash memory, so you can upload a few sequences and audio files. And if that's not enough, there's also a micro SD card slot, so you can get a lot more storage if you need it. Now this controller runs completely by itself. You don't need another controller to control it. You don't need a Raspberry Pi. You don't need a computer. You don't need any of those things. This will work all by itself. All it needs you to do is make a small program file that's very simple to do and we'll look at how to do that, upload it to the board via the micro SD card slot, and then it will run whatever the program file is set to do as soon as it powers up. 
Now this board doesn't have a user interface. There's no way to connect it to a network and go and type in the IP address to look at it because it's its own standalone board. But that means it doesn't have a Wi-Fi chip on it and you don't need to plug it in with ethernet. It doesn't need any of that. It's literally just its own little board isolated from everything else. Now, what are some scenarios this could be useful for? Well, first I'm gonna go over some scenarios this will not be useful for. So let's take a look at those. First, this wouldn't be useful for connecting pixels that you plan on running in a live show. It can't connect to another controller, like I said, or another Raspberry Pi. It doesn't take E131 or Artnet data or any of that. It's just meant to run pixels all by itself. So if you do want to control an actual light show that you plan on expanding and that's bigger than a few hundred pixels, I'd recommend buying an actual pixel controller instead of this. It's also not useful for controlling anything other than pixels or things that can receive a high-low signal. That's the only things it can control. It can't control DMX or any of that other stuff that a normal pixel controller has. Now the trigger pins can act as outputs too to output a higher low signal. So you could have something like an Arduino maybe receive those signals. But other than that, it can't really control anything except the pixels and trigger pins. Now that's actually it for what it's not useful for. It's just mainly not useful for running in a live light show. But it's useful for a lot of other things. And let's take a look at those. First, this can be useful for running a tune to sign that you don't need sync to your show. If you have a pixel tune to sign and you're tired of having to sequence it with the rest of your pixels in the show, you could just put this little board in the tune to sign and on the program files, tell it to just turn on white or blink red and green or just make a sequence for it. And as soon as the board gets power, you could tell it to play that sequence or you could tell it to play it when a trigger pin is set off or anything like that. So it's separate from the rest of your show. It's useful for running a very small light show. If you have something like a couple hundred pixels, maybe that you're putting on an RV or a car or something, or something I really like that the manual says for this is if you want to run a little display on your desk at work maybe, this is something that'll be useful for that. It's also useful for controlling pixel strip, like the kinds that you put around your room or like in cabinets or anything like that, or lighting under your soffits. Also interactive elements such as a photo booth, you could attach a button and when you hit that button, you could have some pixels in the shape of numbers count down or like make a flash so the picture is bright. Halloween props that can be triggered by maybe one of those mats that you step on or an ultrasonic sensor. Maybe you can have some scary thing that looks like it doesn't move. But when one of those sensors are triggered, you can have the pixels flash and then attach something that can receive a high low signal and maybe make motors go off or move the prop or whatever you want. It could also be useful for wearing pixels, like if you have a small little power box and a few pixels connected to it that you like want to put on your shirt or something, you could stick this right in your pocket, put that little power box with it and walk around and have pixels on you. All of these ideas are just barely scraping the tip of the iceberg for what's possible with this. Really the only limit to this is your imagination. I do plan on making some project with this. It's not going to be used for the light show, but it's going to be used for something really cool if I can get it to work. And I'll make a video about that soon. But I'm thinking of attaching this to a go-kart. And I'll let you think about what the possibilities are with this attached to a go-kart. But that's it for the basics on the F-Prop and what scenarios it's useful for. But now we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at all the different things on the board and some specifications about them. So let's go take a look at that. Starting at the bottom left side of the board, there's a removable two port connector that is used to power the board. This connector along with all the other connectors have screws that lift up and down the gate inside to secure your wire. If you turn the screw counterclockwise, it will lower the gate so you can put your wire in. Then if you turn it clockwise, it will raise the gate and grab onto the wire and secure it. The left side of the connector is ground and the right side of the connector is positive. The board accepts either 5 volts DC or 12 volts DC and you do not need to adjust any jumpers or switches to select the voltage. The board will automatically work with either. The board should be powered with only 5 or 12 volts DC and no other voltage or AC voltage. This means you cannot connect the board directly to an outlet. It must go through some sort of power supply first 
to reduce the voltage. Whichever voltage you're using to power the board, make sure you use the same voltage pixels. If you power the board with 5 volts, only use 5 volt pixels on the pixel ports. If you power the board with 12 volts, only use 12 volt pixels on the pixel ports. The two other connectors on the left side of the board are the two pixel port outputs. Port 1 is the top port and port 2 is the bottom port. The board only works with three wire pixels that are WS2811 or have a similar chipset. For more information about supported pixels, take a look at the FPROP manual. When looking at the pixel ports, ground is on the left, data is in the middle, and positive is on the right. Again, the positive voltage will be whatever voltage the power terminal is being supplied with. Each port is fused with a replaceable 5 amp automotive fuse. If the strand of pixels on a port will likely take more than 5 amps, you'll need to power inject that strand. Never replace the fuse with something more than 5 amps. If you do, you could damage the board. Due to the size and limited components the board has, pixel data will not travel as far through the wire like a normal pixel controller would. It is recommended to have no more than 6 feet of wire between the port and the first pixel, otherwise you may experience flickering or unresponsive pixels. Adding an F-amp or pixel data booster can increase that distance to around 15 feet and you can add multiple data boosters in one line to get longer runs. Above the fuses, there's an indicator LED which helps you understand what the board is currently doing. If the LED is blinking on for a second, then off for a second, the board is functioning normally and running the program files you put on it. If the LED is fading on and off, fast or slowly, it's currently loading the new files from the SD card. Sometimes this can be a very fast process and other times it will take a very long time depending on how many files are on the SD card and the size of them. If the LED is flashing rapidly 8 times followed by a brief pause, it is in an error state and you'll need to put an SD card into the board so it can load the log files onto it. After that, you'll have to open the files on the SD card to debug what the problem was. Moving on to the bottom right side of the board, there is a 4 port connector. This is used for attaching sensors on inputs 1 and 2. The very left of the connector is a ground port. Then next is input trigger 1, then input trigger 2, and finally the fourth one is a positive 5 volt output for any sensors that need power. Sensors that need 3.3 volts or any other voltage will not be able to receive power from this board and you'll have to use a separate power supply. Next, to the left of that connector is a small black cylinder. This is a built-in vibration sensor that can be set to trigger sequences. To the left of that is five pins that can be used to attach wires to the board. The very bottom pin is another ground pin. Then the other four pins are the final four input triggers. Input three is above the ground and it works its way up to input six. All six inputs can be used to receive any digital high-low signal as well as output a high-low signal. However, input pins 1 and 2 are slightly different from the rest. If you plan on attaching an ultrasonic sensor, that sensor must be connected to inputs 1 and 2. The correct wiring for an ultrasonic sensor is attaching the ground to ground and the positive to positive, then attaching the echo pin to input 1 and the trigger pin to input 2. Above the vibration sensor is a micro SD card slot that is used to load any program files, firmware updates, or used as additional storage. It can also be used to write log files to the SD card so you can know what's happening with the board if you need to debug it. To put in an SD card, have it face up with the ridges towards the top. The SD card slot is spring loaded so you will need to apply a slight amount of force to lock it in. When putting the files onto the SD card, you could select for them to either flash onto the onboard memory or stay on the SD card. There is exactly 15.35 megabytes of onboard memory and the preferred method is to use that instead of the SD card. The SD card can corrupt over time with lots of reads and writes done from it, so only keep it in if you need more than 15.35 megabytes of storage. Finally, above the micro SD card slot is a 3.5mm audio jack used for playing music. 
The music can be programmed to play with or without a sequence and can play when a trigger happens or right after the board boots up. Two additional things I did not go over is this button and these three additional pins. That is because they have no use to us and there's nothing in the manual about them. But other than that, that's all the components on the board and how they work. So now that we know the basics about the board and how all the components work, the next step is to program some sequences that we'll later put onto the board to run after the triggers or events happen. If you've used X lights before, this step should be very simple for you since we're just programming a few pixels to be running on the ports. We just have to take a little bit of extra time to make sure the correct channels go to the right ports. If you've never used X lights before or you've never even heard of it, I recommend checking out this video right here so you can get a little bit more information about what it is and how it works. It is a three hour long video, but not all of it's important, so you can use the timestamps to skip to some of the key things in there. But now, let's hop onto my computer so we can take a look at how we make sequences for this. So the first thing you'll want to do before we even get into doing anything in X-Lights is you'll want to make a separate show folder just for the F-Prop. That way it doesn't mess with anything in your main layout and that way nothing in your main layout messes with the F-Prop. So I'm going to come up here to the show directory or the show folder and I'm going to hit change temporarily and in my documents I already have a folder right here called F-Prop and this is the one specifically just for the F-Prop. Since you probably don't have one made yet, you can just right click, hit new and new folder and then just name it fprop and open that. But I'm going to open this and I deleted everything so no controller set up, nothing in the layout. And I have a few sequences but I'm not going to open those. Now the way we have to set up the lights for the fprop is a little bit different than how you'd normally do it. What most people would do first is come into the layout, make their light show, whatever. And then when they come to the controllers tab, they would add an ethernet controller like this. You could come over here, select your vendor like Falcon. And then I could say have the F16V5. Then I can enable all of the auto X light stuff. And that would allow me to use the visualizer to move everything. And that would set up all the channels. Or I could do it manually and not put in the vendor and just manually set up the channels for each prop that'd be set up here. But I would still add an ethernet controller because that's what's going to be controlling the pixels. Well, what do we consider the F-Prop? Because there's nothing over here. It's not a USB controller. It's not an Ethernet controller. And I'll get to that and how you set up that in a minute. But first, we're going to do the layout. So here in the layout tab, you could set this up just normally like you would for your light show. You could add a background image if you want. You could add a 3D model for what the f props going to be controlling. But I'm not going to do any of that since this is just an example. Now you could go ahead and add your props and you could add as many as you'd like as long as you're not going over 2048 pixels and you have a way to divide the props up across two ports. If you have a lot of props, you're probably going to be chaining them and having to do power injection. So just be aware of all of that when you're designing whatever you want the F prop to control. So this technically means that if you have a light show that's under 2048 pixels total, you could set that up and have the F prop control it. But the F-Prop just wasn't really designed for that. So I don't recommend doing that. It's a possibility if you want to though. But for what I'm visualizing for this example, let's start off with port one and we'll start by adding a simple star and then we'll add an arch and then we'll add a single line. And this can be all of the stuff on port one. I'll set the arch to 25 pixels and the uh, single line to 25 pixels. That way there's an even 100 pixels that is going on port 1 because the star is 50 pixels. And then for port 2, I'll add a candy cane. This automatically opens three candy canes, but um, I'll set this to 1. And I'll make this 30 pixels for the candy cane. And that's a little big right now, so let's shrink that down to about there. And I'll also put on a 50 pixel wreath on port two as well. So I'll make a circle and it's already set to 50 pixels. So that's good. So for port one, we're gonna pretend there's a star, then an arch, then a line of 25 pixels. And then port two will be a candy cane and a wreath. But now that we have these props up, we have to set up the channels for them. And if you've never heard of channels or universes or start channels or stuff like that, 
I recommend checking out this video up here that's all about that stuff so it would make a little bit more sense. But even if you have just a slight basic understanding about it, you should still be able to set this up. Now, in the manual for the F-Prop, the way it shows you how to set up the props and channels and all that is you have to go and click on each prop and then you have to come to the controller and select use start channel and then you have to select the channel and come in here and fill out this. You have to tell it what the start channel should be or like what model to chain it after and all of that. And the reason we have to do that is we have to order the start channels in a certain way so the F prop can read them correctly because since there's no user interface, it's programmed to send certain channels to certain ports right off the bat. So it will take whatever data is on channel one first and send all of that data to port one and it will send as many channels as pixels that are set up on port one. And then as soon as it reaches the end of the channels for port one, the very next channel will be sent to port two. Now all of this might sound kind of confusing because it is, and I'm not really explaining it in depth that well, but that's because I found a little hack that makes it a lot easier for setting all of this up. And let me show you how to do that. So um, I'm just gonna come back here and uh, make sure that this is set to no controller first. Okay, so I'm gonna come over to the controllers and ideally we'd like to use the visualizer to order the pixels on there, on the F-prop, but we cannot do that since we don't have an F-prop controller we could add that X-Lights knows about. So what we could instead do is tell X-Lights we're setting up a different controller and X-Lights will think we'll set, we're setting up that controller, but then when we have the data go to the F-prop, the F-prop won't care what type of controller it's set up for, it's just going to read the channels and how many channels there are. So let me explain what to do. So you're gonna come over here and click add ethernet and you're gonna add an ethernet controller even though we're not using it. And uh, we can give it a name, I'll call it F-prop. Um, and then for vendor, we're gonna set this controller up to act as an F4 V3 controller or this controller. Now it doesn't really matter which controller we set up, I just picked the F4 V3 because since it has a fewer amount of ports, it's less things to distract us with in the visualizer. And I'll explain why. So I'm gonna select F4 V3 and then make sure the variant is set to no expansion board. You're gonna to wanna to check these three boxes if they aren't already. So auto layout models, auto size, and full X lights control. And then the very last thing is make sure the start universe is set to one. If it's not, change this to one and make sure you have no other controller set up. But just change those few things and then don't touch anything else. Leave it how it is. If the IP address box is yelling at you and it's red, that's fine. Just don't worry about anything else. So now we're gonna come into the visualizer and open this up. And now it's going to show the four ports that would go to the F4 V3. But since the F prop only has two ports, we're gonna pretend that this port right here goes to port one on the F prop, which it will. And this port, port 2, will go to port 2 on the F-prop. And then we're going to leave port 3, 4, and serial port blank. Because if we put anything on there, that's not going to go to the F-prop. Since the F-prop doesn't have a third and fourth port. And we're tricking X-Lights into setting up all the channels in order for us. So we don't have to worry about doing that. So on port 1, I said I wanted the star first. So I will add that. And then next, after the star on port 1, we have the arches. And then we have the single line. And that's everything for port one. Then for port two, we set up, or we haven't set up yet, but we want the candy canes to go first. And then we want the wreath, or the circle as it's called, to go after the candy canes. So there we go. We have this set up, and then we could close this. We can hit save. And if we come to the layout, X Lights automatically configured all the channels for us. We tricked it into doing it for us. So the star starts on channel one, ends at channel 150. The arches comes immediately after at 151 and then so on with the rest. And if you look here where it says controller connection or abbreviated controller connection, it has the type of pixel WS2811. And then the one at the end means this is connected to port one. And the two at the end means this is connected to port two. So candy canes, it's on two, circle is on two, everything else is on one. And now this is perfectly set up fine. So when we make the sequences, when we're done with those, the F prop will read them and it will look for whatever is start channel one first. It'll see it's the star. It'll all put the data for the star. 
and then for the arches, and then for the single line, and all in the correct order. It's as simple as setting up a fake controller, like I said, going into the visualizer, and just pretending that we only have ports 1 and 2 here for the F-Prop. If you are still slightly confused about this, um, feel free to leave a comment and I can try and help you out and explain it um, more in depth if there's something that's not making sense. But that's how I do it. And once we're done with this, make sure everything's saved. But now we could go on to sequencing. But there's just one quick thing first I recommend changing before going to on to sequencing. I recommend going to File up here and then going to Preferences and then Sequence. And come down here to where it says FSEQ version. And usually for you, it will be set to V2 ZSTD default. The problem with this is the FPROP does not support FSEQ files like this. So I recommend you change it to V2 ZLIB. Now, if you don't change it, it's okay because when you put the files on the SD card and put them onto the FPROP, the FPROP will convert the files. However, I recommend just making the files this version from the start. That way there's no error or anything. I've never had problems with it, but it's just something I do to make sure nothing bad happens. And then we can hit OK and move on to sequencing. So I'm going to make a new sequence and then you have to remember what these sequences are going to be used for um, on your FPROP for whatever your situation is. So if you only want lights to do something after a trigger happens, you can make an animation. If you want music to happen with this trigger, you can make a musical sequence. I'm going to just make an animation. And then frame rate, um, the FPROP works with both 40 frames per second and 20 frames per second. But it's just like how a normal controller works, where if you select 40 frames per second, you can't get more than around 700 pixels on a port. And that's just because the data is so fast that it can't make it down the line farther. So if you need a lot of pixels, more than 700 on a port, you can select 20 frames per second. But if you don't, 40 frames per second is an option too. So I'll select that because I like faster frames. And then I'll just hit quick start. Um, we have all the models here, and then we can make a sequence for whatever we want these things to do. So I'm going to pretend that this sequence is set to play when trigger one is triggered, and that could be a button. So I could just program this for a butterfly effect to be on everything. So I'll just paste the butterfly effect on each of these. And the way I did that was I pushed control C on the first one, and then control V to paste the effect on the other props. And then when we move on to programming the F-Prop, I can just tell it to play this sequence after the button is pressed. So I can save this. I'll come in here and I'll save this as video test one. And now I can go on to make another sequence for another trigger. And this could be musical or animation. And I can keep going and make as many sequences as I need for my situation. But I've already made a lot of videos about sequencing. So I'm not going to talk about how to do that. If you want to know more about that, I'd recommend clicking this video up here and watching that. So now that we have all of our sequences made, it's time to program the FPROP and upload all the files to here. But you might be wondering, if there's no user interface and you can't connect to it, how do you program this thing? Well, it's actually very simple. Falcon Controllers has made a tool on their website that we use we fill out all of the settings in it, all of the configuration files and whatever needs to be done. We upload our sequence and audio files, and then we generate that into a configuration file. I think it's a .cfg file or something like that. We then take that configuration file that has all of the settings on it, along with our sequences and audio files. We put it on a micro SD card and we load it into here. And then the FPROP will load that configuration file. It will check to make sure it runs correctly. And if it does, it will automatically begin playing the sequences or listening for triggers or whatever you told it to do for. And if you have all of the files going onto the flash on here, as soon as it starts running, you can take out the micro SD card and let it be. Anytime you plug it in, it will immediately play that program file. If you need to change it, you can make a new one on an SD card put that in, plug it in, and then it will just reload and erase everything else and start with what's on there. So let's go take a look at this tool that Falcon Controllers has made to program this. 
So to get to this tool, Falcon Controllers has a link on their website for it. So I'm going to go to pixelcontroller.com slash store, and I'm going to go to the F prop right here, click on it, and it will open. And if you come down here, right here where it says F prop programming tool, this is what we want. And when you click it, it will open this programming tool right here. The link is pixelcontroller.com slash store slash tools slash prop controller slash fep.html. I know that's a long link, so I'll put that in the description. But let's get started with what everything on here does. Starting at the top, we have this generate button and you click this once you have everything configured on here. This will make a zip file and download it for you. And in that zip file will be the program file and all of the sequences and audio files you need to put on the SD card. The save button will save all of the configuration you've made here and download it to a JSON file. And you can use that JSON file and click the load button to load up an older configuration if you need to. That's fine if you want to do that. The only problem is if you have any files already uploaded here, it will show that they're still on there, but they're actually not. So you'll re need to re-upload those. So I recommend just don't close this page if you're working on something, because if you do, it won't save anything. And then the clear button will erase all the changes you've made and start off scratch with a fresh set of configuration stuff. You can give the configuration a name, so that way when you download the zip file, it doesn't look like this. So I'll call this test for YouTube. There we go. And now next we have the pixel output settings. And this is where we tell the FProp all about the pixels we're trying to run. So the first thing we need to set is how many pixels are in port one and port two. If you don't remember the total, you can go back onto Xlights and look at the visualizer and it shows right on the ports how many pixels are on each of them. So port one had 100 and port two had 80. And it's very important you set this correctly because if you don't, everything is gonna look messed up. The brightness setting is obviously how bright you want the pixels to be. And this is on a range from zero to 255. So zero is the darkest and 255 is the brightest. So if you wanted 50% brightness, that would be like 128 or 127. And you can figure it out for the rest if you want 30% or 75% or however bright you want it. The color order setting is to tell the FProp which order the bulbs in the pixels are addressed in. So if the red one goes first, then green, then blue, or maybe the green, then the blue, then the red, or the uh, blue, then the red, then the green. Most of you are going to have RGB pixels, so you can select that. If the colors aren't lighting up correctly, you should look at the type of pixels you have, look at where you bought them from, and maybe see if it's a different color order. Channels per pixel, this is to tell the FProp how many channels each pixel takes. Um, most of you will probably have three channel pixels because that means there's a red bulb inside, a green bulb, and a blue bulb. If you have four channel pixels, that means you also have a white bulb inside. And if you have four channel pixels, the setup we did in X lights earlier won't be correct. You'll have to change a few things, but I'm assuming almost everyone doesn't use that and they use just RGB pixels. So you can select that. And then you can select the protocol pixels you have, but right now the app prop only supports WS2811. So there's nothing we can really change here. Now, right here is the audio output settings and um, there's a volume setting and a conversion rate setting. I recommend you configure these first before uploading any files because if you upload the files before this won't um change the files the correct way and it will do whatever this was set to before you uploaded the files so volume again this is on a scale of 0 to 255 with 0 being the quietest or actually no sound at all and 255 being the loudest so you can set this to whatever you want it to be and then the conversion rate. This tool has a built-in converter for your audio files. You're probably going to be uploading MP3 files, but the tool is going to convert it to WAV files just because that's what the board supports. And audio files can be quite large, especially when you only have 15 megabytes of flash memory. So you can change what conversion rate you want this to run at and what you want the audio to sound like. So if you set to 48,000, this is going to make the largest file, but it's going to sound the best. If you set it to 8,000, it's going to be the smallest file, but maybe not sound the best. 
I recommend messing around with this and trying some settings because you may not even notice um, if the audio is really bad if it's this low. And then this stereo checkbox, this is to also make the audio smaller. If it's checked, stereo means that the left and right channels in the audio for like if you're using headphones or speakers or whatever, they're going to be separate to add some more dynamic sound to it. But if you uncheck this, it's going to be a mono audio um, file. And that will mean both the left and right speakers are doing the same thing. So you can also mess with this and see how it sounds, but I'm just going to leave it as stereo. And then next is the section where we upload our files to include in the zip folder to um, put on the SD card. So there's two different spots you can upload files to. If you upload the files on the onboard file spot, this means that once you put in the SD card, the files are going to be moved to the flash memory. And that is the preferred method because like I said, the SD card can corrupt over time. If you put files on here in the SD files section, the files are going to stay on the SD card and the FPROP will read them from there. But that means you cannot take out the SD card. It will always have to stay in there for it to be able to read those files. Now, there are a couple of different annoying rules we have to follow when uploading um, files here. And that's just because of how the FPROP reads them. So if you're uploading FSEQ files to the onboard file spot, the files can be named whatever you want. You can just leave them as they are. But if you're uploading files to the SD file section, they need to be named from 001 to 999, with your first sequence being 001 and then working your way up to 999. I doubt you're going to have 999 files on there, but if you do, the last one's going to be named 999. Now, audio files on the onboard file spot those can also be named to whatever you want them to be named as. But then on the SD file spot, those must also be named 001 to 999 if the audio files are playing separately. If they're going to be playing at the same time as a sequence, then you should leave the name to whatever it was when you selected that file in XLights. So if I had a sequence I called test and then the audio track was named test audio, and I selected it in x Lights as test audio, I should leave the name as test audio when I put it here. And then one final rule, when you're uploading the files in the SD file section, you can upload them in any order you want. You can do some sequences first, then audio, then back to sequences, or any order you want. But when you're putting files on the onboard file spot, if you upload an FSEQ file that has an audio track that will play at the same time as it, the audio track has to be uploaded immediately after. So you can upload animations and you can upload audio tracks that are playing by themselves at any time. But when you add an FSEQ file that has audio associated with it, the audio needs to be uploaded immediately after. So let me show an example of this. I am going to click add and then it's going to ask me to click here to drag or click here to upload a file or drag them here. And then I'm going to go into my FPROP folder and I have a lot of different files here. The first one I'm going to upload is a simple test sequence I made. And you want to make sure you select the FSEQ file, not the XSQ or the um, XBKP file, but you want to select the FSEQ file. Now, this file is an animation, so I can just upload that and I don't need to upload any audio that goes with it. And then I'm going to select another one. And this one is simple test two. And I think I have it right here. But now this one has an audio file with it. And the audio file is, I think it's everything is awesome from the Lego movie. Now I need to upload that audio file immediately after. So I'm going to go into where my audio is kept and I'm going to select it right here. And it's just named 001 because I was practicing uploading it to the SD file slot. But you could see when I uploaded the um, audio file, it shows that it's converting up here and it's making the size of it right now. So I'll wait for that to finish and it's loading and there it goes it says it was successful and now i'm going to upload one more file and that is if i can find it simple test 3.fseq and this one has no audio so that's fine so now i'm going to keep coming down i don't want any files on the sd card so i'm not going to upload them there but now the next setting is this player setting right here this is where you tell the fprop what it should be doing by default so what it will do immediately when it boots up and what it will do if no triggers are happening. And now there's a couple of different options, or actually a lot of different options, for what you can select. 
first is blank and what this will do is it will send a signal to constantly turn off all of the pixels so that way they're always off and nothing is happening in the default mode and nothing will happen when no triggers are occurring then you have color wash which will just play a color wash like it would in x lights it's just a color wash pattern that will play over the lights until something happens rainbow will play a rainbow pattern rgbw this will cycle through the red green blue and white colors and the pixels will flash if you select color this will allow you to select a single color to just leave the lights on static for it so no patterns or anything happening i could just set it to have the lights stay on this green color until an event happens and then you could also play some animations or audio files there's two sections to this there's these three options here and then these three options down here these ones are to play files from the flash and then these ones are to play files from the sd card so if i wanted to play an animation from the flash i'd click this and then where it says flash file i would select which file i want to play simple test one two or three or a random one or a sequential one or it could have them loop and if i select random or sequential i can select what the first file will be and what the last one will be if I want to play audio, I can select just audio, and then I only have one option. It's the one audio file I uploaded. It's everything is awesome. And I have the random and sequential and all that options again. Or I could select to play both an FSEQ and the associated audio file at the same time. Now, when I click this, the only option available is simple test two. And that's because that's the only file on here that has an associated audio track with it. So I could select that. And then finally, FX, this just gives you a whole bunch of other effects you could play. And if you click this, these are all of the different effects you could select from. And I'm not going to go over all of them. You can mess around with them yourself. And once you select an effect you want to play, you can come over here to the palette and select which colors you want it to use. So I could select purple and blue. I could select purple and orange, red, green, white, whatever I want. So for now, I will have the player, the default mode, it will play simple test, just this plain simple test. And I think this is just a static on pattern. I'm not sure exactly, but by default, the F prop will be doing that. And then next is the section we've all been waiting for, the event section. This is where we add all the different events and things we want the F prop to do when it detects certain triggers going off. Now, if you want to, you technically don't have to add any events. You can just upload one singular file you want to always be playing and then select the player to always be playing that. So I could just make a really cool animation sequence, set the player mode to that, boot it up, and it will always do that until it shuts off. But that's boring. I don't want the F prop just to be doing that. I want to add some cool things that it can do as well. So I'm going to click add to add an event. And all of these settings right here are the event settings for each individual event. The first setting is the actual event setting. And this is where we tell the F prop what we want it to do when this event is triggered. So we have all of the same options from the player section above, but then we have a few more down here. We have an index option, which can change the index for um, playing sequences. We could change the brightness and adjust it by this percentage. We can click volume to adjust it by that percentage. We can reboot the board and we can set pins high or low or pulse pins high or low. So if maybe I had something that was listening to pin two for it to go high, when this event is triggered, I can, cl I can click here, set pin high, and I will select pin two. I want pin two to go high when this event happens. Or if I only want it to pulse high for a few seconds, I can select pulse pin high I want pin two to go high or on, and then I want it to last for one second, which is a thousand milliseconds. But what I want it to do for this example is I want this to play another animation if this event is triggered, and I'm going to select simple test three. But then after that is the trigger setting, and this is where we tell the F prop what needs to happen for this event to play. So if I want simple test three, I need to have this trigger happen. And there's a lot of different options, but I'm gonna go over all of them. First is the vibration sensor. So this is if I want the vibration sensor to go off and that's when this will play. Now the sensitivity, this is how many times the vibration sensor must shake for this event to happen. 
and zero means it only has to shake once and then um it will play this event it's the most sensitive and then if i set it to like five i think the vibration sensor has to be vibrated around five times until it will fire this event ultrasonic so i can select this if i have an ultrasonic sensor hooked up and then i can tell it how many inches away the object must be for it to fire this event so if i set it to five inches if anything comes within five inches or closer of the ultrasonic sensor it will fire this event or i can set it to like 24 for two feet i don't know how far away the ultrasonic sensor works it probably depends on the one you buy. So you'll have to look that up to see how many inches away it can detect stuff from. But if I remember correctly, I think it can go at least a couple feet. Then we have all of these sensor options. And each sensor has four different options. So we have four for sensor one, four for sensor two, four for sensor three, and so on. So normally connected on any of the sensors, that means that by default, there is a connection between sensor one and a ground pin on the f prop and if that connection between that sensor and that ground pin is broken that's when this will happen that's when this event will be triggered so normally connected means there's a wire or a button or a switch or something between sensor one or pin one and ground and if that is broken this will happen next is normally open and that means that there's that the circuit between the ground and the trigger pin is open. There's no signal going through it. But if a button or a switch or something closes the circuit and connects it, that's when this event will be triggered. And then each of these two options has a sensitivity. And this is how many times the circuit must be closed or open until this will happen. So if I set this to open and there's normally no connection, but I want a button to close the connection three times before this event happens, I would set this to three. And that means it expects a connection between pin one and a ground pin to happen three times, and then this event will trigger. Now, normally connected pull, that is the same thing as normally connected, meaning the circuit is normally completed. But to fire this event, that connection must be broken for however many milliseconds you set. So if I set this to 2000, that means two seconds. This connection must be broken for at least two seconds before the event will trigger. And then normally open pull, that means the connection must be made for at least this amount of seconds until an event happens. So I could set this to 10,000 if I wanted. And that means if I put a button here, this button must be held down to complete the circuit for 10 seconds until it will trigger this event. And each of these four options is the same for every single sensor or trigger pin. And then we have 16 built-in timers, so I can select any timer I want, and then I can select the interval or milliseconds. What this means is this event will automatically fire even without any other inputs from outside of it it will fire however often this is set for so if i set this to twenty thousand, this is 20 seconds every 20 seconds this event will play no matter what happens and now since this timer is set for twenty thousand seconds if i added another event i can't use timer four again unless i want twenty thousand seconds because that timer is already in use and that is all of the different triggers you can select to have to happen for the event to be triggered the next setting is the priority setting, and you use this to tell the FPROP how important this event is. So if you have multiple different events and they're all firing at the same time, whichever one has the highest number priority will go first. And then minimum this event gap, milliseconds, this is how many milliseconds must pass until the event can play again. So if I have a button attached here, and this button plays this sequence that's like 30 seconds long, after that finishes, if I want 10 seconds to pass before it can fire again, I would set this to 10,000 milliseconds. But if I want like a whole minute to pass before this event can happen again, I would set it to 60,000 for 60 seconds. And then suppress low pin and suppress high pin. These are sort of like extra things that can stop this event from happening. So I'll start with suppress high pin since it makes a little bit more sense. If a pin is set too high and this trigger happens, 
it will not happen because this pin is set to high, meaning to cancel out this event. So I have a button on trigger one for now, let's say. And let's say I have a switch on trigger pin two. And if that switch is connected, making a connection between a ground and trigger two, and that would make that pin high. And if that pin becomes high and I push this button, it will no longer happen because I told the F prop that if this pin goes high, don't let this happen. And it's the same thing with the low pin except opposite. So normally there would be a connection between this pin and a ground. But if that connection is broken, causing this to go low, then it will not allow this trigger to happen. And then the next setting is the action setting. And this is how we want this event to fire. If it's set to immediate, this means that this event will immediately stop whatever's happening and play right then and there, as long as a higher priority event isn't playing right now. If it's set for graceful, that means it will wait for whatever is happening to finish before firing this event. Now this sometimes doesn't work because if I have let's say the player mode set to having a color wash, that never ends, meaning this event would never start because it's set to wait till the current thing stops but a color wash would never stop this. Now, an FSCQ animation playing, this does stop, and once it reaches the end of this, then this event will take over. Immediate toggle, this means the event will immediately start, but then the event will not stop until something else happens. So this event will keep running, it will replay the sequence over and over, and it will not stop until something takes over. And then graceful toggle, this waits until the current event ends to play, but then it will keep playing over and over, same thing like the last one, and it won't stop until something else takes over. And then you can hit add to add even more events, and I'm actually going to do that. So I have one more event I want to happen. I'll set this one to a priority of one. This event, I want it to play both an FSEQ file and audio from the flash, and I want it to play the everything is awesome sequence. So the button triggers this one, the first simple test is what runs by default if nothing else is happening. And then to trigger this one, I want the vibration sensor to go off. And if it detects a vibration, then it's going to play Everything is Awesome. And I want this one to have a higher priority, so I'll set this to 2, not 22. <laughs> this minimum event gap milliseconds, this is just like the other one up here that I showed, except this is the total amount of seconds that must pass before any other event can happen. So if event two just finished and I don't want any other events happening until after a period of time, I could set this to 20,000 milliseconds, which is 20 seconds. That means no events can happen within 20 seconds of another event. And then the minimum any timer event gap, this is how many seconds must pass between timers until another timer can go off. So if I don't want two timers firing within 10 seconds of each other, I would set this to 10,000, and that means once a timer ends, another one cannot begin for 10,000 milliseconds. Equal event priority fires, this means that if this is checked, if two events have the same priority and one is running and then the other one fires, even though it's the same priority, the one that just fired will take over if this is checked. If it's not checked, then equal priority events cannot take over each other. Then debug logging, this means that if this is checked, it will create more advanced log files and give more information about what's happening on the F prop. But for this to work, you have to leave the SD card in. That way it can create the file and keep sending data to the log file. And then when you're ready, you could shut off the F prop, take out the SD card, open it up and look at that log file. And then the final setting, run config from SD only. That means that the configuration file will not be uploaded to the flash and the configuration file will stay on the SD card. This is useful for certain debugging purposes, but I recommend just putting as many files as you can onto the flash and trying not to use an SD card. And now I'm going to click generate and this is going to generate that zip file. It's going to ask me where I want to save it. Um, I'm going to put it in downloads, click save, and then it's going to download it. And now if we go into the file manager and go to downloads, we will see it right here, test for YouTube. And now with this zip file downloaded, you're going to want to extract this. So I'll extract it to um, a folder right here, test for YouTube. If we open it, 
Inside it has the configuration file right here, the three FSEQ files we told it to keep in here, and then the everything is awesome file. But now we can put all of these files onto an SD card. So I'm going to pop in a micro SD card into my computer. And if we give it a second, it pops up here. We have old files in here that I was testing before. Um, I'm going to delete these, make sure there is absolutely nothing on the SD card. And actually it would probably be better if you right click it and format it. That way it's completely wiped out. Now I'm gonna come in here in this test for YouTube folder. I'm going to select all of this and I'm going to copy it, come to the SD card and click paste. And there it is. It's all on the SD card now. So now I can close this and pull out the SD card and we can put it into the F prop. Okay, so here's what I got here for this quick test to finish out the video. I have a strand of 100 pixels on port 1, a strand of 50, even though there's supposed to be 80 on port 2, I only have 50, 50 on port 2. Power is coming from a 12 volt power supply inside this enclosure. And I have the button attached to sensor pin one. And now that is not a momentary button. It's a button where if you push it, it will keep sending, it will keep the connection going until you push it again. So I don't know if it's on or off right now. We'll figure it out. And then right here, I have the micro SD card. So you're going to want to make sure power's off and that nothing is on for it right now. And then you'll want to put in the micro SD card. So let me do that. I'm just going to push that in. Okay, it's secure. It's in there. And now that it's in, I'm going to power it up. And now this might take a while or it might be fast. It, it really depends on how it's feeling. I'm going to plug it in. And we should, okay, we see a light. And I'm going to try and zoom in on that. The one light all the way to the left, which is the indicator light right there is fading on and off very slowly that means it's uploading the configuration from the sd card into the flash memory so it's doing its thing as long as it's fading you can just let it be don't touch it okay we're back and we have lights now i'd say that took about two or three minutes for it to upload the configuration but that's okay it's playing test sequence or simple test sequence one which is just on with different colors um, I know it's very bright for the camera right now. Now, if we zoom back in to the LED, we will see that it's flashing now. That means everything is working perfectly fine normally. And what we can do now, if I zoom out, I can take out, it might trigger the vibration sensor, me doing this, so the other sequence might play. But I can take out the micro SD card now, and it triggered the vibration sequence, okay? But now the micro SD card is out, and it's running based on what the configuration is set for it so let me shut this off quickly and um let it turn off and then replay it so that way the normal sequence is playing turn it on you give it a few seconds and it instantly plays what the program files on here said and the sd card isn't in there's nothing attached to it it's running what it was told to do so now if i push the button it should play yep this is the push button sequence and let me unpush the button and oh, that triggered the vibration sensor, me just barely moving it. So for this one, it just flashes a bunch of colors over here. And then this plays a color wash. That's what this one was programmed to do. And this one has higher priority. So if I hit the button, it doesn't do anything. And that's because this sequence has higher priority. And then there would be audio playing. It's playing out the audio jack right now. I just don't have anything plugged in and it's copyright music. So I can't play it anyway. So that is going to conclude it for the entirety of the video all about the F prop. This thing is crazy powerful. And if you have a small display or you're looking to build like a little tiny interactive element or any of the different scenarios I listed in this video, you need to get this F prop. It's available on Pixel Controller's website for $48. And I am so glad they sent me one so I could make this video. If you have any questions or comments or if something didn't make sense or if you just want to say something about the F prop, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section down below and I'll try to respond as soon as I can. And I will also be putting the links to buy this and to the programming tool and anything else in this video that I used in the description below so you can check those out. I'd like to thank Falcon Controllers for sending me this F prop and hopefully I can do a lot of different things with it and make some other videos around it. But that is going to be everything for today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. 
I really regret putting all these pixels on me because now I have to take them off and untangle them and put them away. By the way, this little tiny house that I showed in the intro of the video is actually being ran by the F-Prop in the back. I have a strand of 5 volt seed pixels connected to it and a USB cable plugged to my computer to power it because it's not that much power. So you literally can use the F-Prop for anything. <laughs>